Good morning, every or good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's virtual program with Turnstile Tours. Uh, I am Andrew Gustafson. I will be your host today, and we have a really uh, exciting and, and fun program. We're going to talk about the past and the present, which is what so much of our programming is about. Um, welcome, everybody. If you're joining us for the first time, I see a lot of familiar names and some new names um, as well. So uh, welcome and, and happy birthday to the Brooklyn Navy Yard. That's what today's uh, program is is all about. Before we dive in, I just wanted to mention a few uh, housekeeping things and uh, how the program is going to work today. We want to make this uh, as engaging and interactive as possible. Uh, so feel free to drop your questions into the chat uh, for our guests today. And um, I'm uh, going to be assisted by my colleague Amanda, um, who will be helping uh, to answer those questions. Um, she'll also be dropping resources um, into the chat as well throughout the program. Um, we also have closed captioning available, um, so you can turn that on or off uh, down at the bottom of the screen. Uh, and welcome to folks who are joining us uh, on uh, YouTube. Thanks so much um, for joining us. Um, and uh, a little bit about who we are, what we do, um, if you're not familiar with us at Turnstile Tours. Um, so we're an organization that works with nonprofit organizations um, to research, develop, and operate tour programs uh, in partnership um, with nonprofit and community organizations. And, and we've had uh, the privilege um, to work with the Brooklyn Navy Yard since 2008, uh, offering tours and working with so many of the great companies and stakeholders and community members uh, at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Uh, and so this is now episode 263, I think, of our, uh, of our series. Um, this is the second year now that we've uh, had to celebrate the uh, birthday of the Brooklyn Navy Yard uh, virtually, but uh, we're back to giving in-person tours at the yard so you can join us. And I want to share with you uh, some of our other upcoming programs um, that we have uh, on the schedule, including uh, our Brooklyn Navy Yard tours. Um, so our next program is going to be uh, on Monday, February 28th. Uh, we're going to take a look at the Lost Canals, including a canal that used to be in the Brooklyn Navy Yard, and we still have a little remnant of it today uh, over on the east side of the yard um, along Kent Avenue. Um, so I'm going to be talking about that with my colleague Stefan. Stefan and I are also going to be talking on March 7th, uh, along with some other guests, um, about the Bay Ridge Branch, which is a little known section of freight rail uh, in Brooklyn that is in the news because there's a proposal to turn it into a corridor for mass transit. Um, and then on March 18th, we are, we're going to hit the two-year mark um, of doing virtual programs. And so we're going to look at, back at um, some of our favorite moments um, from those programs. So you can join us for a little, a little happy hour. Um, but as I said, we're back to doing in-person tours at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. So you can join us um, Saturdays, uh, either our past, present, and future tour uh, on about every other weekend. They'll pick up more in April as well. Um, and then on Sundays, uh, on um, the first Sunday of the month, you can join us for our World War II tour. Uh, and then on the last Sunday, uh, we're offering our architecture and infrastructure tour. So if you're interested in history or if you're interested in the contemporary side of the Brooklyn Navy Yard, we have uh, something for, uh, for everybody. Um, but I just wanted to um, mention um, what we're going to talk about today uh, and our very special guests that we have, um, because again, this program is really about the past and present uh, of the Brooklyn Navy Yard. So we're celebrating our history and our birthday, but we're also celebrating uh, Black History Month. Uh, and so we're very excited to be joined in, in just a couple of minutes. Uh, first, we're going to be joined by Keisha Kelly um, from Hip Hop Closet, and she's going to show us around their space in Building 77 um, and tell us about her business, which is uh, now becoming one of the longest tenured businesses at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Uh, and then uh, we're going to be joined by Gina Riley from Rebel Designs. Um, who's going to tell us about how she got started uh, and um, a relative newcomer to the Brooklyn Navy Yard. But um, today is also a, a banner day as well because they just announced uh, the new uh, president uh, of the Brooklyn Navy Yard Development Corporation. Uh, so David Ehrenberg, who's led the yard now for, for eight years, um, is going to be leaving uh, next month. Uh, and they just today, uh, Mayor Eric Adams announced his successor, uh, Lindsey Green. Uh, and she had previously been at the New York City Economic Development Corporation and, and the mayor's office of housing and economic development. 
Uh, and so we're very excited for this. Uh, it'll just be the third woman uh, to lead the Brooklyn Navy Yard and the first uh, black woman to lead the Brooklyn Navy Yard Development Corporation. So we're, we're very we're very excited. Uh, and I think Kaish is gonna tell us, uh, I, actually both of our guests got a chance to meet her uh, recently. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about that as well. But I wanted to start off um, before we bring our guests on um, to um, give a little bit of background uh, about the history of the Brooklyn Navy Yard. And, and specifically, you know, uh, we talked about, you know, the, the importance of the Brooklyn Navy Yard um, in the history of the Black community in, in Brooklyn and how it has been a really important engine for economic development. Um, and so we're going to do a very very quick history, just a couple of minutes, um, but I want to show, show some um, really important key moments, um, especially in the years since, uh, since World War II um, and how the Navy Yard uh, has changed and grown and, and really tried to be um, you know, a very important place um, for entrepreneurs um, to create economic opportunity to, to start and grow uh, small businesses uh, in, in the yard. Um, so uh, I'm going to share with you um, few slides here. Um, so, and then we'll, we'll run, run through the history portion and then we'll, we'll dive into uh, the present day, which is much more interesting than, than what I have to say. Um, but, uh, okay. So, you know, you can look back, we've done a couple programs. We did a program um, in 2020 um, that was sort of about the black history of the Navy Yard up to the Civil War. Um, and then we did one that was about uh, 1865 to essentially 1965, um, so sort of the last century of the Navy Yard as a as a uh, naval facility. Um, and now we want to focus more on what you know what's happened since 19, uh, 1966 when the Navy Yard shut down. But again, quick and uh, uh, rough backgrounds. Um, if you're not familiar, the Navy Yard was established in 1801 as a federal shipbuilding and ship repair facility. Uh, and it was operated by the Navy um, from 1801 up until 1966. Um, and throughout that entire time period, um, there were uh, Black people working and serving uh, at the Navy Yard, although um, it was very uneven in terms of the levels of participation. And this was really um, due to politics and policies that, that changed over time. Uh, in the early days, uh, around the time of the War of 1812, um, there was actually pretty significant um, presence um, of black sailors in the US Navy. Um, but following the war, um, it was clamped down on. And there were fewer and fewer opportunities um, for people to, to serve in the Navy, although they served uh, widely in the maritime trades uh, in the United States. Um, it's picked up again during the Civil War, but then after the Civil War, um, again, it, it tailed off um, quite considerably. And we saw this again um, around the time of, of World War I. Uh, a little bit of an uptick and then a serious crackdown um, on the ability um, of African Americans to uh, enlist. Uh, and they were just talking about the ability to enlist. There were no black officers um, in the US Navy until World War II, actually. Um, but they were certainly a presence uh, at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. You can see this photo from 1920 showing the Brooklyn Naval Hospital. Uh, and so you know, there were sort of circumscribed opportunities within the Brooklyn Navy Yard um, as a military facility. Um, but then there were also, most of the people that were in the yard were actually civilian workers. Um, and here we see the civilian workforce. Again, it was definitely a, a part of the Navy Yard community, but relatively small. Um, and actually by um, 19, if you look at 1940, um, it's only about 3% of the civilian workforce uh, is African American, um, uh, between 3 and 4%. Now, one thing we need to keep in mind is that the Black community in Brooklyn um, prior to World War II was also relatively small. Um, and so in 1940, it's about 4% of Brooklyn. Um, but that starts to grow after World War II. But the Navy Yard doesn't always keep pace uh, with that. Um, lots of people from all over the country flooded into New York because of the opportunities for jobs um, during the war. Um, here we can see uh, one of the first uh, African-American female production workers in the Brooklyn Navy Yard. So women are allowed to work in shipbuilding starting in 1942. There's an initial class of about 120 women uh, and 12 of them uh, were African-American women. And this is one of the first of them, uh, Alberta Day. Um, so an important trailblazer um, in the history of the yard. Um, and so, 
you know, there was an effort that was made in order to create more opportunities um, during World War II, um, largely in response to, to activism. There was a threatened march on Washington uh, in 1941 organized by A. Philip Randolph and other black leaders. Um, and in, in order to sort of forestall that, President Roosevelt uh, issued an executive order that forbid, forbid um, racial discrimination in hiring by the federal government and by federal contractors. So that applied to the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Uh, and so it was supposedly equal opportunity. However, um, there were more than 50 lawsuits that were filed by 1943 alone um, against the Navy Yard for racial discrimination in hiring. And the workforce only ticked up just a little bit. So by 1945, it hits about 7%. Um, and then within two years, um, it falls down to below 2% of the workforce is African-American. Um, and part of the reason for this is that most of the people that were hired during World War II were hired as unclassified employees, meaning they had a job for the duration of the war plus six months. So they were not given the opportunity um, to advance um, in the skilled trades to get supervisory positions. Um, so basically when all those people were laid off, black and white, the proportion um, of black workers again plummeted. Um, but over the next decade and a half, it would start to tick up again, uh, in large part because the composition of Brooklyn um, was changing and the black community was growing substantially. By 19, so 1940, it's about 4%. By 1950, it's almost 8%. 1960, it's 14%. So it's basically the proportion is about doubling every decade. Um, and then by 1970, it's, it's, a, it's about a quarter, um, which is where it stands today. And so the Brooklyn Navy Yard workforce starts to reflect better the community in which it's, it's situated, um, better than it was doing um, during World War II. Um, and so by the time the yard is approaching its closure, you know, about one in five workers is African-American. Uh, and so threats to close the Navy Yard were seen as a, a big threat to the economic sustainability um, of this community. Uh, and so here we can see on the left, there was a, a rally that was held in the summer of 1964 um, as the Navy Yard was rumored to be on a list of facilities that the federal government was going to close. Um, this rally was actually attended by the person who was then running for the U.S. Senate to represent New York, uh, Robert F. Kennedy. Um, and so in his um, unfortunately short career, you know, Brooklyn uh, and the area around the Navy Yard was an important focus for him. Uh, and so uh, in 1966, he embarked on a, a tour. He, he came to New York City and did a tour of, of Bed-Stuy um, and uh, was working with the Bed-Stuy Restoration Corporation, which was, um, you know, looking for ways to try and, you know, restore the housing and the jobs and the services that had started to disappear in part as a result of this big economic engine, the Brooklyn Navy Yard, closing up shop in, in 1966. So, um, you know, Robert F. Kennedy is, is elected in November of 1964, but just a few days after he's elected and before he's able to take office is when the Pentagon uh, announces that they're going to close the Navy Yard along with 94 other military installations around the world. Um, but, um, you know, this, this idea of the Navy Yard um, being able to be a, an important um, engine of, um, of economic development, even after the Navy's left, is something that starts during this time period. Um, and so the bed Restoration Corporation and the Pratt Institute for, uh, the, excuse me, um, the Pratt Center um, would become an important um, in helping to direct um, the future of the Navy Yard. Um, so in 1967, um, they, this is kind of the first, uh, you know, post Navy jobs program at the Brooklyn Navy Yard, which is um, they create this training center to teach people how to drive trucks and buses. Um, and so this is actually over on the east side of the yard. The building where they did this, I don't think is standing anymore, but here you can see uh, Mayor Lindsay um, showing off uh, this uh, New York Transit Training Center. Um, and so this is before kind of the picture of what the Navy Yard is gonna become has, has come into focus because it's before the city has even bought the property. Um, so that would happen uh, about two years later in 1969. Um, the city would buy um, the, the about almost 300 acres um, from the federal government for $23.5 million. Um, which is also interesting because it's somewhat unprecedented in the post-war period that the federal government actually made a municipality pay for property rather than now they just transfer it for it for 
uh, free or for a nominal sum, um, but they actually made the city of New York pay for it. Um, something that the, the city of New York had a hard time affording um, during this time period. Um, so that doesn't happen until 1969. Um, and essentially the plan that they line up um, is to turn it back into a shipyard, this time for private shipbuilding. And so this would be kind of the first decade of the Navy Yard's post-Navy life uh, would be sea train shipbuilding. Um, and so this is also really important because more than 80% of the workforce um, in sea train um, was African-American. Um, and so there was uh, a really concerted effort to create training programs for people in the community to come and get um, better paying jobs at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. And they ultimately built the largest ships ever built at the yard, which were a number of crude oil super tankers. But again, it was a very kind of boom and bust um, dictated in large measure by changing policy, changing global economy and, and the changing um, economics of the US shipbuilding industry. Um, and ultimately in 1979, Sea Train would go bust uh, and we would lose about, at that moment, about 1300 jobs. Again, 80% of them were, were African American. So it was a huge blow um, to, the, uh, to, the, to the local community and, and the economy. Um, and so, yeah, Cindy dropped a few, few things uh, into, the, into the chat right here about how, yeah, people don't realize that these were the largest ships that were ever, um, ever built during that time. So 1979 uh, is again, a huge step back is taken for the Navy Yard um, and for its role um, in you know, creating economic opportunities. Now at this time, there were other businesses in the yard, um, but you know, by the mid eighties, it was fewer than 40. Um, it wouldn't really be until the early 90s when we'd start to see, you know, hundreds of businesses and really the Navy Yard be dominated by uh, small businesses, um, which is what we see, what we see in the yard today. Um, and I just want to give a shout out. Uh, these photographs is really an invaluable um, documentation we have of the yard during this time period from Frank Treza. Uh, who worked uh, at Sea Train um, during this time and carried his camera with him, just like this welder you see in the middle of the photo, uh, and took the, these incredible photos that are now part of the um, Center for Brooklyn History Archive, as well as the Brooklyn Navy Yard uh, Archives. Um, and Frank has a website, which we'll share with everyone, um, where he's uh, written about um, sort of correcting what he's, the uh, history of the Brooklyn Navy Yard and where he sees, you know, silences in the public record about the yard, which is what we're all about. Um, and he also wrote a book about his experience, uh, Brooklyn Steel Blood Tenacity. So again, really an incredible, very lucky that we have this record um, of that uh, of that time period, which is not very well documented otherwise. Um, yeah, so that kind of, um, you know, is a very rough, summary of, the, of, the, of this uh, of this time period. So, you know, through the 50s and 60s, we see pretty steep progress and growth of the Black workforce for the federal government um, at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. You know, huge loss of jobs, almost 10,000 jobs as a result of the yard's closure. And then Sea Train, um, and more importantly, the organization that ran the Brooklyn Navy Yard, which was the, which was CLIC, uh, Commerce, Labor, and Industry in uh, County of Kings. Uh, which was the nonprofit organization that ran it. Um, and so, you know, Sea Train leaves in 1979. It's also revealed that there are a lot of issues with mismanagement um, at Click. Um, and there's a, a major corruption scandal, and there's a big issue with embezzlement. And so ultimately, um, Click uh, is transformed in 1981 under uh, Mayor Ed Koch into what we have today, which is the Brooklyn Navy Yard Development Corporation. Um, and so the BNYDC. Uh, its mission is still today to create good quality jobs for local people in industry and manufacturing and, and create that economic opportunity um, for, for local people. Um, and so, yeah, that's, again, a very, very quick summary um, uh, about where we are today. And the yard looks very, very different um, from what you see today. We still have a shipyard. We still do ship repair. Um, but as you're going to see, very, very different types of businesses. And today we're largely going to focus on um, fashion and accessories. Um, and we have some really wonderful guests who are going to talk to us about what it's like working in the Navy Yard um, today uh, and being part of that community. Um, and so what I want to do now is uh, introduce our first guest, 
Um, and so I'm going to ask Kaisha to join us, um, who is joining us from inside Building 77 uh, on the sixth floor. And she is uh, assisted by uh, Doug, who's our camera person today. Kaisha, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Um, welcome. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. That was an amazing um, backstory and history lesson. I loved it. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, but we're, we're here to hear of, from you and about your business. So, so tell us a little bit about Hip Hop Closet. Uh, and and what you do. So we started Hip Hop Closet, my brother and myself, in 1998. Originally, we were just online, so we were hiphopcloset.com. We moved into the Brooklyn Navy Yard in 1999, and we sell clothing and accessories dedicated to the hip hop culture. So we even sold magazines at one point when magazines were a big thing. Um, we ship worldwide. And but our claim to fame, and I'll show you around, are custom made sheepskins and leather jackets. And those are handmade here in Brooklyn at the Brooklyn Army Terminal. And we also do t shirts and stuff. But over here, these are some of our most popular sellers. They're super warm for when it's cold outside. Um, and we go all the way from like the classic 80s style, which was like a big staple for hip hop to like the newer versions, the heavy <laughs> and um, leather coats. And then over here, we all, these are some of the um, t-shirts and sweatshirts that we make here in our studio, um, Brooklyn's own because Brooklyn BK all day. <laughs> and this one originator, this one, the, um, the new president, Lindsey Green wore this one today at her announcement. So that was super exciting for us. And then we have some other ones, UNITY and Alby Square Mall. This is a ode to the Alby Square Mall, which was a very popular mall that we all used to go to that's now City Point. So that's we're here in Brooklyn, I mean, in um, Building 77 in the Brooklyn Navy Yard. And we, we, we moved into the bu Building 77 in 2018 as a place to have our customers come. And we also do events in here, small events, karaoke nights, book signings, listening parties, a bunch of the different events to bring the brand to life and kind of just connect with our customers, have our customers in the community have a place to come and collaborate and all that good stuff. <laughs> So, so tell us a little bit about what, what it was like in 1999 when you first moved in and you, you were over in Building 131, right? Yeah, we, we were in build, Building 131 and then we moved to Building 62 and then we moved back to Building 131. And um, it was a much different place. It was like really like kind of deserted <laughs> a little bit. Um, and there weren't as many businesses but it still was, I'm born and raised in Fort Greene. So it still was like home to me, you know, I'm right up the block is where I was born and raised. So still my stomping grounds, but it was a much quieter place. And what was it like? You, you, you're starting a, basically a dot-com company in 1999. So what was that like? Because you're very early to the to e-commerce mm -hmm. on the internet, right? Yeah, yes. It was exciting because um, of course I didn't know what I was doing. So I had to, um, figure everything out. My background is in engineering. I have a degree in civil engineering and I was actually working in California as an engineer designing the infrastructure for the internet, lo and behold. <laughs> and um, my brother came up with this idea and I was totally confused because I didn't have a computer at home. I just knew that I'm laying these cables for the internet, didn't fully understand what the internet was. And I started doing some research and realizing that, oh, wow, this is a, an untapped market right now. It's brand new. So we kind of just figured out everything as we went along. Us entrepreneurs, you know, we, we're ready to jump out the window and then figure out if we have a, even a safety net or <laughs> a parachute. So that's kind of like what it was, like just figuring everything out as we went along. And I see some, some pieces, like I, I think some, some stuff would fit in really well in 1999 and it fits in today. So it seems like a lot of the styles have come full circle. Yes, yeah, that's the interesting thing about fashion. I mean, it just, 
it, it's this constant evolution. It's this constant loop that just always comes back. And we noticed that, par- you know, our generation, our, our core market is like 40s and, and 40s to 50s, 35 to 55, let's say. And I find all the time that they'll buy something, take it home. And if they have a teenager in the house, it's getting snatched from them. And so the teenager will take the clothes and they'll be back like, I need another one because my son or daughter took it. So it's like, yeah, it's a generational thing. Um, and so you said, you know, back in 99, when you moved in, that the yard felt, felt kind of deserted. What's, what would you say is the, is the biggest difference now? And, and what, um, you know, how, how are you? connected differently to the yard and, and other businesses? Is there more of a community now than you felt back 23 years ago? Yes, absolutely. Um, I feel like it really started probably around 2016. I think I was in the first Brooklyn Navy Yard um, business cohort. And I was in that with 10 other businesses. And they basically really took us through an intense, like I would call it an intense MBA type style program where we um, developed a growth plan for our businesses. And that's when I really connected and, um, you know, like built a network within the yard of other businesses and realized, oh, wow, I can work with you, you know, like this, this stuff that I need that you can do and, and it just became this like one big family, like we made it through the cohort. <laughs> and, and then the Navy Yard has just been doing a lot of events and a lot of community building. And they're so dedicated to helping us grow our businesses and stuff. So it's, it's really, I, I love it here. <laughs> I remember you were part of a fashion show on the first floor of 77. That was that in 2018? Yes. That was in 2018. Um, it was our 20th anniversary. And we um, were announcing that we were moving into this building. So yeah, that was my very first fashion show. And I really have to like give it up to the Navy Yard for like just standing behind me on that. And I pulled in as many businesses in the yard as I could. The idea was to announce that um, we were the new hub for fashion. There was a new hub for fashion opening up here in the Brooklyn Navy Yard because there's a lot of fashion brands here now. Yeah, and we had a question here, which is, um, do you work directly with other makers or manufacturers in the yard? Or you mentioned one in the Brooklyn Army Terminal, but are there others that you work with that, that are local as well? Yes, yeah, so there's a company called Fidelity that we work with. They do um, a lot of like wallets and stuff like that. So we work with them. And when pandemic first started, we pivoted into masks. And we would um, have masks with like interesting sayings on them. I'm not going to say them now. Some of them were kind of <laughs> explicit, but um, like kind of like hip hop terms and stuff, but relating to stay and stand back. And <laughs> so we partner with um, one of our cohort um, co- co- colleagues and they were making masks stitch in the next building. So we collaborated with them and they would make the masks for us. And then we would print these different sayings on the mask. So we work with them. Um, and Rustic is gonna be opening up in our building. We're gonna collaborate with them on a lot of events and stuff, kind of take our events into, the, into their area and you know get people down there. Yeah, and uh, we just drop your your Instagram into thank uh, you into the the chat. So check them out, and you're you're doing uh, IG lives all the time, right? What what are some of the yes. things that you cover in your in your Instagram lives? So it started out um, during um, Black Friday. I did an all day live where I kind of took you through a day of clothing that you could wear from Hip Hop Closet. So I started out wearing a onesie. And that extended to the second live too, because it was so comfortable. I didn't want to take it off. But um, I did that where we just kind of talked about our products and, you know, how they feel, how they fit, how they're made. And then it extended. People liked it. So then I just continued talking about products. But this month was a special month where I brought in a lot of my business partners and we talked throughout the month. I did them two times a week, which 
when I said it, I didn't realize how much work it was, <laughs> but so I'm going to scale back um, next month. But I to just talked really about business and what it's like to run a business. Um, when pandemic started, a lot of small businesses opened up, a lot of people opened up businesses. So I just want to share as much knowledge and information that I have gathered throughout my 23 years. And so we kind of just talked about that, the good, the bad, and the ugly of running your own business. <laughs> And speaking of that, uh, Kina has a question here. She says, how do you feel about the legacy you're creating for your daughters and women in general by owning and operating your business? You know, it feels really good. Um, it took me a long time to realize, like, really what I was creating. Um, it, you know, when you're like kind of living it and in it and you have aspirations for more, it's really kind of hard to stop and celebrate the small victories and really take a step back and look at, wow, I've made it this far or we've, we've been doing this. So I've done that a little more. And um, my daughter, she's actually doing a lot of design work and stuff. So she wants to get into fashion. So it's really, it makes me feel good that I can help her in any way. My nephew now works with us also. He actually designs the shirt. He actually makes the shirts, does a lot of production work and stuff. So it feels good to see the next generation coming in and I'm able to be a better manager as a result of the cohort and the, the different workshops that the Navy Yard offers. So it feels, it feels really good. That's great. And what, what are some of the ways in which, I know things were on hold for the winter. Um, oh, we just lost her for a second. I think Doug will get her back. Oh, yeah, I think a call was coming in. Oh, <laughs> no worries, <laughs> no worries. Um, but, uh, you know, I know things were, were on, uh, your events kind of came back and then went on hold and then might, they'll be coming back again. But what, what are some of the, the events that you've held in, in your space, having now a more publicly accessible space in Building 77? Yeah, yeah, that's been the really fun part. Um, our, hands down, the most popular event is our themed karaoke nights <laughs> where, um, we usually have like some sort of hip hop theme, either it's like R&B and hip hop collaborations or just we pick an artist and you have to recite all of their lyrics. <laughs> and so that gets to be a lot of fun. Um, we've had marketing seminars for small businesses. We've had um, listening parties. We've had meet the author um, discussions. We've had what's also really interesting, a sip and write. So instead of painting, you're actually writing. And so we have um, an editor that comes in and she gives you different prompts. And those are also themes. Our last one was a Love Jones theme, the movie from the 90s, I guess it was the 80s or the 90s. We did it around Valentine's Day and she gives you a prompt and you kind of write for 15 minutes and then you can share or not share. Those always would turn into like a therapy session. People would wind up crying, laughing and everything in between, but those are always really fun. Um, well, my wife, Cindy, and I were, were huge karaoke fans. And I think Ooh, this, you have to come. You yeah, have this to is come. probably definitely Cindy's wheelhouse. So um, feel free to drop in the chat. I know Cindy will. Uh, any of your favorite karaoke songs that you want to sing at, at Hip Hop Closet at, at the next uh, karaoke. Yeah, event. we did one in the lobby last summer. We did one. That was really fun. Yeah, yeah. The, when the Navy Yard was doing the, the weekly um uh, yeah, I think it was happened. Thursdays or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and again, a big, big shout out to, to Kina, who's uh, Beats and Eats. Yes, thank you, Janice. Yes, and Beats Kina. and Eats. Yes, yes. Yeah. Shout out to Janice and Kina. Yes, they're great. Um, yeah, and so I just, uh, we have another question here, which is, um, so you mentioned the silks, uh, you're doing silk screening. Um, so in addition to being your kind of studio and, um, you know, uh, uh, a a showroom. Uh, you also mm -hmm. do some production in there. So yes. silk screen, is there any other kind of production that you do there? Um, mainly just um, the masks and the t-shirts. Those are really big. So we do jobs for um, a lot of different organizations and we also do like the drop shipping for them. So as they have members that join their organization, we'll make the t-shirts and ship them out for them. We also, since our main um, business is e-commerce, we have started to assist other smaller businesses that are just starting out in e-commerce. 
with their distribution. So we did we definitely opened that up since it's it's easy for us now. We we know how to do it. So we're so we're helping people do that. So you're sort of like a logistics company too now. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Just more of what we've been doing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, that that's great. So if anyone has any other questions, um, feel free to drop them into the chat. But but Keisha, this has been so great. Thank you so much for for sharing a little bit of your story and uh, you know how you've been able to navigate this really difficult time. But you know you had you 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 have lessons of more than twenty years to to help you get through this. Yes. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Awesome. Um, oh, someone asked, uh, Aliza asked, how do we get in touch with you? Oh, yes. Yeah. So we're on IG, Hip Hop Closet. And um, our website is hiphopcloset.com. And we're here in the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Um, so you can send us a DM or email, info at Hip Hop Closet. And, you know, that's how you can reach us. And I'm just going to pull up uh, your website here so folks can see. Yeah, all of the contact information is on the website, our phone number, everything, hiphopplaza.com. You didn't say you're also a model. Oh, that's something that I, that's new to me. I've never, I, I actually just started like two years ago. Um, you know, I, I figured I needed some pictures for something. And so I did it. And now, like, you can't, like, you can't put me back in the box now. Like, I'm ready. Like, I'm, <laughs> like give me the diva fan. I'm ready for it all. <laughs> um, and you're doing, um, so custom sneakers. Are, are you working with local artists or are you doing some of that oh, customizing yeah. yourself? Oh, yeah. So, yeah, so that was an exciting thing. Last summer, we partnered with um, Pratt Institute. So we had some students where we taught them the basics of how to design, how to paint the sneaker and the um, ins and outs of it to make sure that your paint sticks and all of that fun stuff. And um, so we're going to start that program up again in the summertime. But for right now, we just do the sneakers in house ourselves. Awesome. They look great. Thank you. Yeah. Um, all right. Great. So um, yeah, thank you, Amanda, for dropping the, the links um, in there if you want to get in touch with Kaisha. But, but thank you so much for joining us. Thanks uh, to Doug for being our camera person. Um, yes. Yeah. Uh, so, so thank you. So now um, we're going to move on to our next guest. Bye. Um, Bye. And I want to welcome uh, Gina Riley from Rebel Yay. Designs, um, who is also joining us from Building 77. Uh, Hi, Gina. Welcome. Hi. Uh, how are you doing? I'm good. How are you? Good. Thank you so much for, for joining us this afternoon. Um, so I'm going to ask you the same, same thing. Tell us a little bit about, uh, you know, how your business got started. You're relatively new to the uh, Brooklyn Navy Yard, but you've been in this industry for, for a long time. So. Yeah, I won't say how long because, you know, I don't want to tell my age, you know, a girl never tells her age. <laughs> so actually, um, yeah, we've been in the Navy Yard um, since uh, 2018 as well, actually. Um, but I started my business, wow, years ago, actually in Brooklyn, in my studio apartment, which was located in Park Slope, Brooklyn. Um, and it's important for me to say I started in my apartment underneath the stoop because that was my goal to have a <laughs> studio apartment underneath the stoop. And so years ago, um, that's where I started my business. I had come from corporate retail. Um, I had I'm originally from Michigan. So I had moved here from Michigan um, because I was in school in college in Michigan at EMU and everything that I was learning about uh, fashion, I was in fashion uh, marketing and merchandising and everything that I was learning uh, really was geared towards the fashion capital of the world, which is New York City, right? And uh, I was fortunate enough to have a brother who lived here. And one day in class, I just had an aha moment hey, why don't I just move to New York and go to school there? Which I did, and I um, uh, ended up getting into the Macy's training program, and I went to school and worked um, doing that. And anyone who knows retail, Macy's was, at the time, the boot camp of retailing. So if you ever wanted to learn anything about 
retail or fashion, that's where you would go and work. So that's what I did while um, in school. And so I did that for many years. And um, after uh, leaving Macy's, I went on to work at Learner New York for a while. Again, um, uh, learning more about the back end of retailing. And I, I, I learned so much at working in both those places. But at some point, I got a little burned out because I was working seven days a week, you know, 12 to 14 hour days. And what I truly learned was that um, fashion is hard work. It seems glamorous on the outside, but it really is from the back end, it's a lot of work. And so um, it sort of prepared me um, and propelled me into this next chapter of my life. I, I had another aha moment. Why don't I put as much work into um, starting something of my own? And that's what I did. Um, so I started this business, as I said, in my studio apartment in Park Slope, Brooklyn, and I started making jewelry and not really sort of knowing what I was going to create. But my initial creations were uh, these little figurines that um, uh, I actually called rebels. And I called them that because they had little arms and legs that moved and uh, mostly, you know, they had fists that were like thrust into like protest or what looked like it was thrust into protest. And subconsciously, lately I was thinking about that. And subconsciously, that was probably my inner self. I had been working corporate so long, looking at numbers, doing Monday meeting, Monday morning meetings, color charts, um, managing floor moves, and, you know, not really feeling that creative. So in actuality, when I created these little rebels, it was probably my inner self protesting and just being happy and feeling that I was free at last, thank God of my <laughs> free at last. And I actually um, uh, made these figurines into like charm bracelets, into necklaces, into brooches, and they were in all color creeds, cultures. Um, they, it was very, very, very creative. And they just like looked like little, as I said, figurines. And one of my first customers was my brother, who, uh, as I said, was an actor on Broadway at the time. And so he would wear the jewelry and go into work. And his um, actual, actual, actually his friends and cast members used to really adore what he was wearing. And he would get a plethora of like, you know, compliments. Oh my God, that's so fabulous. I have to have it. Where can I get it? And he would say, you too can have it. My sister makes it, you can order it and she will make it and, you know, you can have it as well. And so I began getting orders for it. And that's really how this business began. Um, it was actually my brother and his cast members that started first buying the line. And, um, so I started making and shipping to them. And that was really inspiring because, you know, that was a real creative group. Um, and it inspired me that like, you know, I was making actually something that people liked and wanted to wear. And then I started taking what I had learned from working corporate America and thinking, okay, so how do I expand on this, right? And I started selling at craft shows and art shows, um, street fairs around the city. And I was actually able to make a pretty decent living um, doing that. And so I did that for a while and I started to listen to my customers and build on the brand. And I actually realized that if I'm gonna make a go of this, I have to do something more than these figurines because they were very involved. Um, and it took a long time to make each and, and each individual figurine, right? So if I'm going to actually build this brand in my mind, I thought, okay, I have to expand the brand and include other things, right? Because it, it was a very specific um, market that you know was buying the figurines right so um i then just started expanding i changed the name of the business from rebel to rebel designs and i started doing trade shows at uh the javits center here in new york had a little tiny booth 
in the Javits Center. My first booth was probably like an eight by six or an eight by eight booth. Um, and my brother, God bless him, um, brought his creative spirit with me. And we um, designed my booth because, uh, you know, I'm a firm believer that, you know, um, presentation is everything. And so was he. So we would create these little wonderlands like in my booth for people to come and shop at. And it began to grow. Like we would do one trade show and then I'd get orders. Um, and then, cause initially right at the flea markets and craft shows I was selling direct to the customer. Now I'm building a business where I'm selling to, to other retailers and I'm selling wholesale. So it was sort of a different business model. And um, I actually was able to continue doing those shows and continue growing my booth and growing my business. And, uh, and then we sort of ended up here. I mean, I, I'm skipping a lot, but you know, I had a store um, in Park Slope, Brooklyn as well. Um, at that time I was selling other people's wares as well. I, I sold ceramics, but it was all handmade things because the idea was that I would have a store that I could collaborate with other artists and show their work as well as mine. And that's what I did in Park Slope. But unfortunately at the time when I started that store, my mom got sick. Um, she got diagnosed with colon cancer. So I quickly had to close the store and I asked all my friends to come and this is TMI, but it's just kind of giving you a background to how we got here today. I asked all my friends to come come to the store, help me move quickly um, because I had to go home and help take care of my mom. I, again, I'm originally from Michigan. And so they all took pieces from the store. I closed the store, I moved to Michigan and unfortunately my mom died six months later. Um, I then moved back to New York and I do believe that my mom had something to do with this. I needed a place to uh, begin my business again. And I um, had my eye on this building, which was a jewelry building in the jewelry district. Uh, it was 303 Fifth Avenue on, 31, on the corner of 31st and 5th. And I'll never forget it. From Michigan, I contacted the manager at that building. And he said to me quite quickly, oh, no, we have no space in this building. I mean, we are full. Absolutely not. And so I said, okay, and still thinking and not knowing what I was going to do while I was in still in Michigan, and my mom had passed away again. And that's why I said she was an angel on my shoulder. Um, shortly after that, prior to coming back to New York, one day, I just received a call from Richie, the manager that said, hey, are you still interested? Because a space just opened up here in 303 and it's on the 18th floor. It's X amount of, you know, footage. Uh, could you and would you be interested in this? And I said, absolutely. I ran back to New York and that's where I first had my showroom and studio in 303 Fifth Avenue on the 18th floor. I was so excited. It was, it was after coming off of a really depressing time, I felt really inspired and uplifted. And again, I know that my mom had something to do with that. And so I moved into 303 Fifth Avenue. I started my studio there. I was still making, still shipping to stores. Um, doing trade shows, and I grew the business from there. And that's where we actually stayed for a total of 17 years. And we moved from the 18th floor to the 19th floor to the 20th floor, from the 20th floor back down to the ninth floor. Because as we grew, we kept taking more and more space there in that jewelry building. And so a lot of our business life was spent there in 303 Fifth Avenue until we moved here to the Brooklyn Navy Yard uh, in 2018. And so here we are, Rebel Designs Accessories Inc. Yeah, and, and what made you get into to jewelry? Is it something that you had been, like where, where did you learn to make jewelry? Um, so I left Michigan and I came here, as I said, I, I started in marketing and merchandising. So I sort of am self-taught. I was always interested in fashion, 
the entire time I was growing up. Um, I come from um, a family of women who always, and not only women, but men, as I said, my brother too, you know, they always believed in looking good, um, you know, and dressing well and adorning yourself with not only jewelry, but, um, you know, nice clothing as well. So I always sort of had my eye on jewelry. I was always interested in making it, but I didn't go to school for it. So I'm sort of self-taught, but I did go to FIT where obviously, that is like one of the best design schools in the country. So I was inspired by that and also uh, by just being here in the city. So uh, I would say I'm, I'm more self-taught than um, technically trained, obviously, to make jewelry. Um, and I know we have some images um, that we can look at of, of some of your, your work and, and how your, um, your collection has evolved over time. Um, so I'm just going to pull those up and we can kind of walk through them and also see a little bit of the production process, um, that awesome. you, that you have, um, at the Navy Yard. Okay, great. Okay. Can you see that? Okay. Yes. Um, yeah. So, so, um, tell, tell us what we're looking at here. So this is our, um, our showroom in the Navy Yard in Building 77. And this actually um, is our, uh, we have a different, we have an 18 karat gold line and we have an antique brass line. And so this is um, in our 18 karat gold um, section of the showroom. It's where we um, allow customers to come and choose, you know, their collections for the upcoming, um, season. So that's what you're looking at there. This is actually our display and our displays at the trade shows um, mirrored this or this mirrors our, our setups at the trade shows. So basically it's the same. We, the mannequins are part of our branding. The metal tables are um, were designed by us and part of our branding as well. The dark walls, you know, and so for the gold, um, when we did the 18 karat gold, we wanted the gold to pop. So our, our mannequins used to be more beige, you know, a lighter uh, mannequin. So for the gold, we did um, all black or very, very dark, dark paper mache, uh, paper mache mannequins as you see here in the picture. Um, and how can people, can, is your showroom open to the public or by appointment? So our showroom is open by appointment um, only, but it is open to the public as well as to the trade. Great. And so they can, they can call, you know, for an appointment, email for an appointment, DM us for an appointment. But as I said, we are in building 77, so we're easily accessible and we welcome everyone. It's just by appointment only because it also is our studio. So we, we don't want to, um, you know, clash with, you know, you know, sure. anyone coming to the door and knocking when we might be in the middle of an appointment or, um, yeah, so we just need to know that you're coming. So yes, it is available by appointment. And so this is, um, this, this that you've put up now, this is part of our newer collection. Um, this is, we, we, we do not only women's, but we do men's as well. So um, on the right side of the screen, this, these are some of the styles that we have um, done for men. There is um, the uh, silver bracelet with antique brass in the center. And um, he's also wearing um, one of our newer rings. Um, with baguette crystals that we have made. And he's also wearing, we also do handbags. So we do a little bit of everything. So, um, and he's wearing also a necklace that we do for, for men. Um, and that's just a sampling of what we do for men. As I said, we do both women's and men's. We do jewelry and we do leather handbags as well. So, and to the right, she's showing something that is also part of um, our newer collection where she has some of our earrings. She's wearing earrings that we've made out of Swarovski crystals and she's holding actually a pendant, which is one of our designs um, that we do as a pendant, as a bracelet and as an earring. And it's done very well for us. But what's important to state is that 
all those tiny crystals that you see there are all hand set by my team here at Rebel. So we're not a huge team, but we've been together for a long time. And I call us a small dysfunctional family. And um, so the girls make all of this by hand. They hand set everything. All the handbags are made here in our studio by hand. So I think that's important to state because a lot of times people see the variety that we have and they think, oh, that must be made in China. But we have the bags under our eyes, the blisters on our fingers <laughs> to <laughs> prove that we are actually making it all here. So um, please, to the audience out there, if they wanna come see, uh, we're, we welcome them. This is another um, one of our um, newer lines. This is African turquoise. So we don't just do crystals, we also do semi-precious stones. So this is African turquoise. Um, she's wearing an African turquoise ring and bracelet that we have, um, uh, that I designed and we actually make here in the yard as well. And I think it's beautiful. It's a, a beautiful combo. Not to say, I mean, she's not bad to look at either. So Aisha is the model here and she's she's gorgeous and she's helping Rebel look amazing. And this is your move, move in, right? This is our move in actually. So, you know, when we moved here in the Brooklyn Navy Yard, it was actually, um, wow, that was a learning a, a learning uh, curve in and of itself because we moved from a building that whenever we moved from floor to floor, they actually did the move for us. They did the um, the uh, renovation for us. We moved to the Navy Yard. It was this blank canvas and we had to bring everything from there here. So this is uh, just showing you that this was a blank space. And then we did we designed and did the build out. It was a lot of work. It was fun, but it was a lot of work. Uh, this is just a few of my team members um, working on the kick press machine. So originally when we started doing the line, we didn't do any sewing. We did everything on a kick press machine, which is what the girls are working on here. And so that was kind of one of our uh, branding things is that we don't sew, we use the kick press and we're able to design these unique designs without sewing and just using the kick press. We've later changed that. We do sew here as well now, but that's what this is. This is just the girls working on the kick press machine, making um, bracelets, but they also make handbags on that machine as well. Uh, and we had a question here, um, which is, um, do your team members come with the skills to make jewelry and accessories or, or, uh, or do you train them? Um, actually, they don't come with the skills. We do train them, um, but it does take um, a while. It's not something you, you don't learn to do all these things overnight. Um, and uh, even me, I started doing it right. But now you should see if I go to help them, they're like drop kicking me away from doing it because <laughs> I haven't done it in so long. And, you know, they're perfectionists and, um, that perfection comes with time and that skill comes with time. It's not something that happens overnight. It's a skilled, um, it's actually a skilled job. And because you can't sell things that are not, you know, basically perfect. Well, actually I say we're perfectly imperfect, but you do know what I mean. It, it yeah. does skill and it does take time to learn to do these things. And you have to have great eyesight as you see here here is one of my team members. And this is a very, very tedious, small crystal that um, Lisa is gluing here. I mean, can you see that? Cause I can't, and I have on my glasses. <laughs> this is why I'm no longer allowed to make. I help when it's really, 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 really necessary. But yeah, she's um, gluing those tiny crystals and they're actually you know, every, all our crystals are hand set. So the one that she's working on, you can see how tiny it is. And the one above that, look how tiny that is. And some of our pieces have over 600 crystals in it. Wow. Um, and I think we have a video of some of this process. So sure. Um, we had a question here, which is how many people do you have on, on staff? So we have shrunk. We are much smaller than we used to be. So now there are six of us. Um, and at times um, 10 to 12, depending on where we are in the production process. We used to be as big as 20. Um, 
but you know, things change and COVID definitely has changed things. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to say even necessarily for the worse, but it's different. And this is our core group here. Like we are always this core six group of people, but like I said, and we are as big as like 12 and uh, we've been as big as 20, but right now we're, there are six of us. Mm -hmm. Um, and here we can see the setting. So that was the kick press and this is- Yeah, that was the kick press machine. And this is also just the setting. And, you know, they're um, as quickly as you see that video is as quickly as they set those stones. <laughs> right, that's amazing. <laughs> I think we have one more here. Uh, this is, um, uh, this is uh, Tatia who's uh, creating one of our, um, handbags here. This is one of our signature bags, um, one of our zipper bags. And, you know, there's a lot of love put into each individual piece that we create. And, you know, it's time consuming, but they're so good at it. They make it look easy and make it look fast. Um, and the finished product, you know, I'm really always proud of the finished product, but, you know, it's just important. I can't stress enough how you know, it's a skill that, you know, it takes time to learn, but once they get it, they've gotten it. And that's Rebel doing the darn thing. And she will, if you keep this on until the end, she will hold up um, the bag. And this bag has done very well for us for several years, actually. It's one of our best selling bags. But you see, and that's Beautiful. not, you know, and it comes in all different colors and um, we have several versions of it, different sizes of it. So um, yeah, that's some of what we do at Rebel and that's how we get down here. And um, we're just happy to be here at the Navy Yard to be able to explore um, more and more designs by bringing in the machinery that we need to create. Well, I, I know we're, we're just about out of time, but uh, I want to end with this question, uh, which came okay. from the audience, which is, what's the best advice you can give a new and upcoming designer and business owner, or someone starting their own fashion business? Um, you have to love it. Because at the end of the day, you know, owning your own business, it, it can be tough. It's rewarding, it's ex extremely rewarding but it is tough. So if you don't love it, I would say don't do it. And you sort of have to have thick skin because you know you have high highs and low lows and you know some days you wake up and you're just like what the heck am I doing? And other days you're like I'm so proud of what I'm doing. And also at some point you're responsible for more than just you. So you have to really, really, that's my first advice. You have to really love what you're doing, right? At the end of the day, I absolutely love what I'm doing. I love working here with my team. I love creating. And so that's at the end of the day, what keeps me going. It's not necessarily the money. I, asp I aspire and everyone aspires to make lots of money, but that, you know, that is far few and in between. It doesn't happen overnight that you make all this money. The hard work you will see comes first. So my advice is to, you know, do your research, hire a good accountant, um, love what you do <laughs> and, uh, you know, just go for it, but just know that it's not easy. It's rewarding, not easy. Well, as a fellow small business owner, I'm, I'm going to second all of those points you just made. So I totally agree. So Gina, thank you so much. This was such a great conversation. Um, thank I learned you so, so much, much for I'm, having me. Yeah, yeah. Um, and thank you to our audience um, for joining us today and all your great questions. Um, thank you to um, our team, Amanda and Doug and Cindy behind the scenes. And thanks to uh, everybody at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Uh, for helping put this together, especially Adriel and, and Kina. But um, thank you so much, Gina. Um, have, a, have a great thank day. You, you um, too. Everybody, please check out um, both of our guests today, Hip Hop Closet and Rebel Designs. Um, we're going to follow up. We'll share links um, so awesome. you can check them out. Um, and uh, yeah, let us know if you have any questions, want to follow up about anything we talked about in the program today. Um, but Gina, I'll leave it at that. Thank you so much. Um, enjoy Thank your you. day and everybody, we'll see you next time. Okay, awesome.